Previously on Describe Your Kill. The good news is you are all now level 12. Yay! Yay! This is a TTRPG podcast. We've got looting to do. <laughs> <laughs> are you familiar with the carnival? It's most often associated with illusions and, and false dreams. Yeah, it would appear we have also come into possession of some remarkably powerful cards. I've been wandering aimlessly for uh, the last couple of years, and it seems like this is the first thing that's brought me purpose. Can I uh, roll a thievery check to see if I can pickpocket him? <laughs> what the fuck? These cards belong to a greater whole, a powerful collection known as the Deck of Destiny. <gasps> Literally, at breakfast this morning, you walk downstairs and what has two thumbs and two harrow cards? <laughs> this guy. <laughs> you instinctively know that a new reality itself has been created. What? Aaron can't resist. He looks into the card. As what a portal <laughs> bursts into existence in front of you. I don't like it. I don't like that at all. Hi everyone, this is Kimon, otherwise known as Wilhelm Krongard, and it is time for another episode of Describe Your Kill. Just wanted to say a huge thank you for the amazing support over the last few weeks. We continue to be blown away by the feedback and it's so great that people all over the world are listening to us five idiots every single week. Now, in my opinion, this is where the prologue ends and the real adventure begins, so if you made it to here, it's only gonna get juicier. Prepare for blown minds and enjoy episode 9 of The Death of Destiny, A Whole New World. Hello and welcome back to The Death of Destiny, episode 9. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 It's been a couple of weeks since we recorded. How's everyone feeling? Oh, yeah, I'm very good. Well I'm rested. Excited. Very much. Excited. I feel a Always. bit nervous. I feel a bit nervous, nervous knowing what's what's to come, or not knowing what's to come. Or... Natural, I would say. I've literally spent the entire week coming up with portal puns. So. <laughs> 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 the, <laughs> <same> title. <laughs> the cake <laughs> is a lie. There you go. Absolutely. There comes a point, I guess, in most adventure paths. Sometimes it starts with a bang. I've I feel I want to kind of have a little chat. Obviously, last week was where I feel that the story gets blown wide open. It's where everything changes, where the course you're on suddenly deviates and you're in a whole different headspace and stuff. I just kind of wanted to see how you guys felt about that. There was obviously a lot of conversation with DRAL, and then there was the process of this realisation and this, your characters now know this, they instinctively know this. And there's obviously a bit of railroading there of being on the path of the story. Kimon, I don't know if you uh, had any thoughts as that was happening and, and where you thought it might be going versus what you've now discovered. I mean, it was really unexpected, for me at least, um, although I've never played a pre-written campaign before, so I really didn't know what to expect. Now I do. Um, I don't know if all of them are like this, but I am, for one... Fucking excited. <laughs> Aaron, you were the one who was uh, took the bait, looked into the card, <laughs> and have opened this portal in front of you. What's going through Matty's mind at the time? Yeah, I was curious as to when the adventure was really going to soup up, I guess, because it started quite... Um, like a little bit dry, I guess, because there's just been a lot of kind of go and beat these NPCs. And like the hook is obviously, you know, we've, we've come across this dead body, but then you've got to go and do a lot of kind of heavy <laughs> hey, look influence. At our influence system. Yeah, <laughs> the inf yeah, 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 influence <laughs> system. So um, I think that that's quite a, a dry way to kind of get started. But actually, all credit to the writers, because I think that all of that kind of scene setting 
has meant that this reveal really just kind of came out of nowhere and i think you could hear it in my surprise last week where i was like just had no anticipation that that was what was going to happen so now like Moan, i'm super excited yeah that's pretty wild reveal uh jason were you as a gm i sensed the frustration of obviously the influence system which we've talked about already but what is this like what is going on i could certainly i think sense some frustration from you like why are we going back to this and stuff like how, how are you feeling about it now knowing what's before you yeah i, I think it's it's a very it, it's a very different pace to stuff we've done before like extinction curse and um mm, yeah. to a lesser extent like plague stone and abomination vaults this is the they sort of tended to either either start relatively quickly or you you were certainly thrown into the meat of the story quite quickly in those this is the first one that has it as matty said it was a very very slow very deliberate build and whether that was you know excellent work on the part of the writers or whether it was simply a case of ah we've got to shoehorn this influence system in somewhere we've spent so long on it someone has to use it please (laughs) Um, there was a third option there but yeah we don't need the GM's excellent control of the story. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It is, or, or, you know, the, G, the GM had just forgotten to make notes and was just, you know, stalling out the session. Uh, it should have been session <laughs> more three. I just, I just yeah, fucked it up. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or it was us just sticking around at breakfast for four hours. It didn't um, help. But yeah, no, is is I like, I, I do like the fact that one, you know, this is presumably things really kicking into gear, but two, the fact I, I haven't played an adventure path before that has had a genuine like, wow, okay, things are... Things are on now. There hasn't mm. been a moment like that in anything else we've played. So, yeah, more of that, please. Nice. Well, there is plenty more, I can assure you. Chris, uh, what's, what's your take on it? Yeah, uh, it has gone a bit crazy, hasn't it? I, uh, Yeah, I echo everything everyone said. Does anyone have any predictions, Chris? Do you have a prediction about what you think <laughs> might happen? Well, it, we've seen sort of the... A port, we've seen kind of into the portal, right? We, we In a way, is that right? Have I... Uh, that I right? think no. I think you can see into the portal, but as of right this second, no, we we've don't seen know. this okay. portal. I think the episode ended with you, this portal as as Aaron manifested this. Well, I wonder if it's a little bit like uh, Inception, maybe like a dream within a dream within a dream. Okay, that kind of that kind of way. That's why I reckon. Anyone or else got any predictions? We're, we're going to come across a lot, lot more tieflings and devils and stuff. So. <laughs> you know, that might be the other one we're just gonna step into hell yeah i think it's because you you said that we got the sense that a new reality had been created and mm. i think that i think that's what feels particularly exciting and why i feel in the pit of my stomach actually genuinely nervous because i i got no idea what to expect because um like the rules of reality could be very different in this new reality so it, it could be like that kind of going outside of Galarian entirely into a new kind of plane or demi-plane or, you know, where just the rules are completely batshit. Indeed. Well, should we play some Pathfinder, boys? Yes, oh, lads. yeah! Let's go! <laughs> I'm good, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you locked off, Jason? <laughs> ready. So, a very quick recap, because we have just finished officially chapter one of book one. The four heroes, unknown to each other, share a vision. And within that vision, or after that vision, they wake up with one of these very powerful Harrow cards in their possession. You see three moves ahead, and you all eventually end up there at the same time where Hadjek, the owner, has been murdered. And in her store are two demons that are demanding information about cards and when you defeat them and search the office, you find another one of these powerful cards. You also see that Hadjek had done some of the groundwork and had been trying to find Diral Mernese, this expert within the Harrow and all things Harrow related, of course, with his famous Harrow, Barrow. And so we spent the next few episodes sort of speaking to these three shopkeepers, who it turns out each had a piece of information that could help you find d location. But at the same time, you are set upon by some mercenaries claiming to work for Varnev the Butcher. You dispatch of those fairly readily and eventually catch up with d 
at this place called Stirrup and Barding, where you are still now, of course. Combat breaks out. This large tiefling man and some more assassins and this unknown creature attack you here as well. And then once you've had this conversation with Dral, you've learned that he believes that these cards belong to the deck of destiny and that it is either very old or a very new creation, but obviously very powerful. Dral gives you the carnival card, believing that it will return to him. He has tried to get rid of it but it does not. It stays with you. You then realize you have six cards, one from each of the suits, and then we have the realizations of you've created this new reality that is called the Harrow Court, that if you spend long enough, you are able to activate a way to journey to the Harrow Court. And that is where our story begins this evening. Now, I will warn you, there's going to be a lot to take on tonight. <laughs> There's going to be a lot. But it's it's all good stuff, so we'll just take it at a nice, gentle pace. But you are indeed still at Stirrup and Barding. Aaron, the carnival card is in your hand, and this portal has manifested in front of you. Okay, so the portal's just erupted in the room, and I imagine yes. it's quite disruptive and, like, swirling around and, like, a big gust of wind that kind of thing so yes you see this portal and the edges of it look like a riffling a riffling deck of cards and this sound fills the air of these riffling cards a quick etymology question here which is exactly you know a podcast is the form of this does anything other than cards riffle <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question mm, Just, I, I, pages these are these are the important questions we are here to answer. Let me just Pages, riffle maybe. through my brain and see if I can figure out the answer to that. <laughs> riffle me this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's That's a good the question. Title. Write in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Write in. Describe <laughs> your kill at gmail.com. Does anything else riffle? Do I see anything through the portal? Is there any kind of visible oh, destination? Oh, you do indeed, yes. You can see through the portal... Imagine all of you are fairly dumbfounded by this, but you can see into what appears to be a cathedral like chamber with bare stone walls, very dusty cobwebs, very run down almost. Not damaged, but just unused. And from the limited view you have, you can see dozens of stained glass windows each depicting different scenes from the harrow, allowing light to stream into this dusty chamber. So instinctively seeing this in front of him, Aaron almost kind of moves forward, just seeing this passageway kind of appear in front of him, but then doubles back and looks around at the others to kind of see their reactions to what's just happened. But he's continuing to kind of move towards it. Wilhelm puts his hand on Aaron's shoulder and says, we might want to think about this before just jumping in. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's gone through. Yeah, yeah right. they're all just gone. <laughs> Sorry, we, you told us to think about it. We were thinking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm Sorry. My common is not the best. I meant we should have a conversation about this. <laughs> <laughs> Say what you mean, Matt. <laughs> but who, who knows how long the portal will stay open? We've, we've created a new reality. That's what I feel. I am just sorry. Lupin, go, please. Uh, uh, <laughs> what, what, through the portal? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um... I, I would, I would perhaps echo Wilhelm's caution. Yeah, whilst you may be, may be correct, Aaron, we we may have created new reality. We should perhaps consider that uh, that reality may not share features entirely in common with our own, such as the air we breathe. Malachi stands there, um, completely like jaw, jaw on the floor. May I try something? And Lupin sort of steps forwards towards the portal, and. Um, removes the mirror on the chain from around his neck and closes his eyes and focuses for a minute and he attempts to basically create a mirror version of himself on the other side of that portal 
GM, this is going to be up to you because technically it says another space I can see within 15 feet. Lupin, you focus your mind and create the duplicate, but rather than it appearing in a place you can see, it has appeared on the other side of the portal. Looking Wonderful. In. So um, <laughs> both versions of Lupin, because this is an exact duplicate, um, both versions of du Lupin just sort of stop and, and sort of take a breath and, and look around. And um, does that version uh, of Lupin sort of take any damage or see uh, anything? Sorry, uh, what I mean by that, Jason. Sorry, it's so I'm in the room. Oh, actually, it's in the room. The yeah, other side in, on yeah. The, okay. yeah it's, it's not appeared on the floor within the the portal room. You can see it has appeared on the floor on the other, like still in the room you are in. Okay, cool. And no, your duplicate sense. sees the exact same view that you are seeing from the other side. No, You'll that's fine. Can you breathe? Will... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. It's it's a it's a literal mirror universe. <laughs> <laughs> right, moving on. Back to the uh, saucy wench. <laughs> Nothing to see. Yeah, we've got breakfast to have. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it was worth a try. Malachi like feels around him to pick up something like a one of the hammers or a piece of coal or something that is is just to hand mm -hmm. and tries to throw it in still slack jawed he's not really looking around but he just picks an item up Malachi we say that you find like a an abandoned hammer or something yeah, just on and the floor you chuck it through the portal and you see it go through and clink clink onto the floor in the portal itself and that is all and that is all seems a bit safe to me <laughs> I'm convinced. Tr truly a man of science. <laughs> <laughs> I've done I've done science. I've done science today. <laughs> you scienced the shit out of that one. <laughs> um I mean this could be our destiny. Yes, it could also you know, could also be the end of us. I dare say standing around here staring at it all day though isn't uh, isn't necessarily going to uh, going to benefit us too much. Aaron senses that everyone's clearly feeling um, unsure about stepping forward but he knows in his heart that he just wants to move in but he's not going to do it without the group so he says I think that maybe I could just look into the fates and see if this is the right thing for us and he casts augury yes mm -hmm. so this spell allows me to gain a vague glimpse of the future so during the casting of the spell I will ask about the results of a particular course of action. The spell can predict results up to 30 minutes into the future and reveal the GM's best guess among the following outcomes. Good, bad, mixed. The GM rolls a secret DC6 flat check and on a failure, the result is always nothing. So basically, this is just a way for us to hopefully get a gauge as to whether stepping into the portal immediately mm is going to result in something good, something bad, or mixed. Now, I love the spell. Am I right in thinking that does the carnival card give you bonuses to that? Yes, I was just reading that. I just want to double check it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, with this, my, uh, my flat check to obtain reliable information from divination effects, such as the augury spell, are reduced by two, so it will be a DC four flat check rather than a DC six. Okay. With your talent for rolling natural threes, that isn't reassuring. I'm not a roll. Uh, do I roll? I guess I do roll it. Do I? No, the GM rolls it. So GM rolls it, and so I it's going to be a twenty. 20 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what? This is one of the few um, times so I can roll my. Can you see my new uh, shiny dragon eyed dice? I see those. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, well, that's the twenty. Fancy. That's nice. Dragon's eyeball. So, so you cast Aaron's, the augury spell. Yeah, he starts to cast this, and it takes a little while to get going. Um, and so, as he's casting it, he's he's asking to the group and says, "What should I ask to the fates? We must be very exact with our questioning. Perhaps it could be something as simple as, will we be safe if we go through the portal?" And he looks around at the um, at Malachi and Wilhelm. To see if they agree with that. 
Wilhelm kind of nods, still unsure about the sort of situation. Is that specific enough, though? The answer that we'll get won't be overly specific. It's a vague glimpse into the future. Well, I, I, yeah, Lupin knows best. I'm just <laughs> impressed you can <laughs> even do this. So um, let's let's try it. I think you've been reading my business cards, Malachi. <laughs> <laughs> And Aaron asks, if we step through this portal, what will happen? I have my dice in my hand for the DC4 blackjack. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> no way. The result is nothing. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a picture of this. Oh, that's funny. Oh, I know it's a secret role, but fuck me, that's funny. Oh, uh, so so Christ as sake. that happens, then um, Aaron says, well, if we go through, nothing will happen. It's going to be fine. Yeah, I mean, that, that, yeah, yeah, that meta game is, but yeah. Oh. I, couldn't, I couldn't stop the laugh on the roll. No, you couldn't. <laughs> For fuck's sake. Oh, no. Well, I can categorically say that something does happen because the ammo went through. So who's going to go first then? You don't understand. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for some clue as to the connection with the Harrow. This has plagued me. It's followed me for years. I need to know. I need to step through. So the question is, I'm going. Who's coming with me? Wilhelm puts out his rapier. His other hand still on Aaron's shoulder and says I am still kind of cautious but if you if you go there then I will still honor my promise to you I will follow you anywhere um before we do can I uh just sing us a little song cause I am I'm not feeling too good about this <laughs> oh no Carry on my wayward son. No, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this. I can't do this. <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh, God. For some sort of bonus episode, like at Christmas or, or like April <laughs> Fools or something, we're going to have to release a section of like outtakes and fuck ups. Yeah. Yeah. This is a. This will be a continual yeah. feature on Dick Talk. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So everyone's given us a really good role play there. Malachi, he's asked you, what do you think he's going with, with or without you? What does he say? Well, I'm, I'm coming with you for sure. Lupin looks at the others and uh, he's fascinated by the portal, but he doesn't seem especially keen on going through it. But I think, sort of seeing the determination on, on the face of the others, he just sort of resignedly shrugs. <sighs> You three are going to be the death of me, you know this? And uh, <laughs> steps towards them. And with the backing of uh, the three comrades behind him, Aaron feels bolstered and he steps through the portal. Aaron, you step through the portal and rather than any kind of strange visions, loss of senses, weirdness in your mind, you step through the portal into this space and Aaron you step through and you can see that you are very much in a new location but you are able to breathe it feels normal and as you look around a cursory glance at least reveals no immediate threats you turn around and face the others who are standing still in stirrup and barding whilst you are very much not it's safe to come through Wilhelm has already stepped through before Aaron said that. Did we hear we, that? If we had, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, did we hear Aaron say that? Or? Yes. Oh, that's okay. okay. That's Interesting. Um, then yes. Malachi steps through, hold, holds Lupin's hand, <laughs> drags him through. <laughs> um, yeah, Lupin takes a a deep breath and uh, sighs and steps through. You step through the portal. <sighs> New map! New map loading. New map music! <gasps> Ooh. 
The bare stone walls of this cathedral-like chamber are draped with cobwebs and dust. No furnishings adorn the immense hall, while the ceiling above arches up to a height of nearly a hundred feet. Dozens of stained glass windows, each depicting a different scene from the harrow, allow light to stream into this dusty chamber and several wooden doors allow exit in all of the room's walls, but one. This wall, to the north, instead features six shallow alcoves filled with swirling grey mist. Each alcove is framed by an elegantly carved archway featuring decorations from the six suits of the harrow. Hammers, keys, shields, tomes, stars, and crowns. And as you step through, you again instinctively know that you are now standing within the realm of the Harrow Court. Wow. Hmm. You look around you. It is dusty, but it is safe as far as you can tell. One thing you also see here on the map which is just to the north of you this is a really big map i would say it's probably what 120 feet something like that 150 feet high along these alcoves to the north each colored and lit you also see what appears to be a human man stood there cleaning some kind of pedestal or railing Hmm. has he noticed us he doesn't appear to have not noticed you does the portal stay open behind us The portal closed as soon as Lupin came through. So you are now completely in this enormous cathedral-like chamber. On the map, you'll see there are kind of six exits on the east and west and to the south. All of those have doors on them. And yeah, that's what you see. Lupin will see the the man. I don't think he'll call out to him, but he'll sort of raise a a hand in, in like sort of greeting and acknowledgement to see if he he gets any response and yeah he is say polishing this railing that's there and sees you wave and lifts up his hair, hand and you hear him say hello sire puts his hand back down uh, good day um where are we sire S- sire are you asking me or are you are you telling me we're in sire that's dangerously close to the shire and i think we might be on some fairly tricky ground um legally <laughs> <laughs> he puts down his cleaning cloth and approaches. I'm sorry, sire. Uh, did you ask me something? Uh, yes. Uh, um, this is going to seem a seem a strange question for someone who's just arrived through a large shining portal, but uh, where are we? Sire, you are in Harrow Heart. Harrow? In the Harrow Court. I'm surely you remember. I, I, I'm afraid. Um, right, I'm, I'm not sure I do. Um, can I... Is that a a name Lupin would recall or be aware of? Can roll society. See, probably should have rolled that before I answered, but you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> um, society. Uh, that's a natural nine for twenty-three. The only thing I can tell you, Lupin, is that the Harrow Heart is you instinctively know that this is the reality that the the cards from the deck of destiny coming together has created. Okay. And this gentleman, this smartly dressed gentleman, looks almost like a butler, kind of stares at you with a slightly confused face. Will you be dining with us this evening, sire? I, uh, and it's a, I, I think this is a rare moment where Lupin is is slightly off, off his game. Is He's normally very poised and, and sort of very used to reacting to surprising things, but he's genuinely quite thrown by everything that's happening. So I, I think sort of stares blankly for a second like, what? Malakos pokes him <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> you're weird <laughs> Tyre yes, it's real of course it's I'm real. I'm real you all appear to be acting rather unusual you know you know who we are well, of course. I, I'll, well, I, I know I'm quite famous, but 
You are the masters of Harrow Heart, no? We are. We are. We are. <laughs> Will you be dining with us this evening, Sires, or can I continue with my cleaning? As you can see, there is much to be done. Yeah, it's a bit. It's a bit messy round here. Why? Why haven't you got it done a bit quicker? Cut him some slack, Malachi. He he was just created. Your chambers are likely ready for you if you wish to retire for the evening. The hour does draw late. Um, I, I am I am sorry, but um, and Wilhelm tucks away his rapier. I seem to have forgotten your name. You may call me Milton. Milton, yes. This might seem like a strange question, but have we been here before? My sire, you are the, the masters of Harrowheart. I understood that, but have we been here before, physically? I'm afraid I do not know the answer to that question, sire. Will you be dining with us this evening? Malachi just turns and has a look at the um, mirror on Lupin's... Looks at him. Does Does Malachi look like Malachi? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think we can go for some dinner, can't we, lads? Yeah, I think that dinner would be nice. Y- yes. Very well. Wilhelm instinctively checks his head for the horn. The horn is still on your head. In fact, you look at each other and you all look exactly the same, a little cut and bruised after the recent combat, but you are all still very much the same people. And Wilhelm asks Milton, this, this horn, have I always had it? Why, yes, sire. Of course. You, you, you must... You, you must forgive me, Milton. Is uh, it, it would appear that uh, that something is is amiss between our collective memories and, uh, and yours. Is uh, this will be something I'm sure we we will look to investigate in the in the coming hours. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, would you mind enlightening us as to your role here? Of course, sire. Perhaps I should give you the the general introduction of of where you are and what you are doing. Yes, it, it would very much be appreciated. Let me bring up my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Sires, you are within the Harrow Court. This here is Harrow Heart, situated on a hill at the very centre of the Harrow Court. Within the realm, there are many locations. Desert, farmland, forest, lake, mountain and swamp. It is like many sonic levels all combined into one. <laughs> I cut that one. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it a politeness laugh. Fuck the rest of you. <laughs> Within Harrow Heart, it is a sprawling mass of chambers. There are bedrooms, dining halls, the Grand Hall. Waves his arm around. There are even training rooms and workshops, all to be used at your convenience. The citizens of Harrow Heart are here to serve you and assist you as you require. How goes your mission of reclaiming the Deck of Destiny? Our, our mission? Why, yes, sires. Is that not why you are here? I'm aware this is not going to be the most helpful of answers, but uh, we have no idea why we are here. We, uh, I, I dare say it is related to, uh, to the, these cards which I assume, I assume belong to this, and uh, Lupin very deliberately air quotes, a deck of destiny, which you were, but uh, beyond that, I'm, uh, I'm afraid uh, our purpose here is, is remains much of a mystery. I believe, sires, that this is a question I am unfit to answer. I am but a humble butler, but if you do require any tours or locations or indeed sustenance, I can serve you. You will, of course, notice the six portals to the north. I have kept them as tidy as possible, as requested. Uh, yes, uh, that's very much appreciated. Uh, yes. If, if I may, sire, may I return to cleaning or go and ask the cooks to prepare your evening meal? Lupin sort of looks at the rest of the group for, for a little bit of a cue. I think that it would be a, a good idea to rest. Uh, I think we've had quite a long day and it might be a good idea for us to take stock and maybe over dinner Milton you could tell us more about this place and what we'll find through the portals and Sire is that a 
invitation to dine with you this evening. If you'd like to. I would be honoured. I will speak to Mabel in the kitchen and have her prepare and set a table for five. Dinner will be in one hour. Was that sufficient? That's great. Thank you very much. Good day, sir. Bows his head and wanders off and out of one of the doors. What is going on? My mind is blown right yeah. now. <laughs> we're, we're not even acting. We're not even acting. <laughs> no. Uh, I love this. I think this is genuinely the first time in, in a tabletop RPG that I've been at a loss for words. Yeah. <laughs> it's so weird. It's so yeah. good. I love it. Yeah, play in Don't Be Afraid of the Weirdness. So Milton's just gone off. Milton has left the chamber. Yeah, and he's left you alone in this large, dusty, almost ethereal chamber. The doors to the sides, I would say, are slightly smaller. The one to the south is probably much bigger. And in fact, one of the doors is is quite destroyed. And you can kind of see out there. And it is nighttime. As Milton leaves, Wilhelm dumbfounded and, and he just says... Is this a con? I don't think so. I think... I think this is very, very real. All of this. It is a con. They've, uh, they've more than earned their money. I just want to send out a blast of detect magic. Mm-hmm. What's the range on that? About 120 feet, I think. Uh, the range is 30 foot emanation. You do not detect any magic. So, the surrounding area it is real it's not an an illusion this is all like real stone and carpeted flooring in this cathedral room this is real you spend a few minutes yeah yeah i'm gonna let's say i'm gonna say erin uh walks north towards these um these portals did you say towards the north these glowing they certainly look like that. So he's going to basically be sending out blasts and trying to determine whether the surroundings are an illu- like an illusion or magic. Or I just want to try and get a, a feel and grounding for this. Everybody roll perception. Let's roll some dice. Open is fine. That is a 24. I've rolled privately. Hold on. Wilhelm, you rolled a natural 20 privately. <laughs> nice. I'm not going to re-roll that. <laughs> Aaron, so you... Have a little walk around and maybe all of you start kind of just wandering around a little bit within this this hall that you're in. Slightly decrepit, but not not crumbling, just dirty, unused. And you kind of maybe find a piece of stone on the floor and you pick it up. It seems very real. The carpet, although threadbare beneath your feet, feels like carpet. Aaron, you're walking around detecting magic. You don't detect any magic until you wander to the north of this great chamber underneath the stained glass windows where these portals are and then you absolutely do detect magic coming from those portals can i see through these portals as well so if i just kind of walk left to right do i see through those portals like we did before when you're stood sort of 15, 20 feet away from them, they seem like swirling grey mist. But if you approach within 5 to 10 feet, the portal does indeed part and reveals lands beyond. And as you walk up the row, each one reveals a very different location. This is fascinating. Uh, Mr. Malice, you've, you've got to come and see this. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry. I was, um, Lupin had been just sort of busily expect- inspecting a sort of small statue that was on top of one of the rails. Mm. So uh, he'd, he'd been somewhat distracted by that, but uh, his hearing air on call, he uh, he wanders up towards these portals. Lupin, as you approach the grey mist that is there, as you mm. step close enough to it, the mists part, revealing lands beyond. As I said, each of these portals is framed with a different with framed with a different symbol of each of the harrow deck suits so lupin is going to see the portal on the far left which has a uh, a hammer on it yes and is going to uh, reach into the inside pocket of his jacket 
and uh, draws uh, his card, the the Paladin. She studies briefly and sees in the uh, in the bottom right corner the suit, which is the suit of hammers. Yes. It, it looks down at the suit and, and looks up at the portal. Is is it a, a sort of a, an exact match, or is it? The symbol is an exact match. Yeah, Lupin. What I'll say is you've kind of stepped. Not obviously through the portal, but you've stepped close enough to kind of have a good look at it. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. You look through that first portal and you see some kind of forest clearing dominated by a few fallen trees. You can see plant life. You can see fauna. It is daytime on that side of the portal. But as you draw the paladin, you feel a power within you surge yet again. Because you have unlocked the epitome of your Harrow card. What? Are you ready to get nerdy? <laughs> yes! Yes! Let's get we're nerdy We're playing a TTRPG podcast. If we weren't, we're in the wrong fucking place. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you've drawn the paladin. I have drawn the paladin. So in the book, this is kind of inferred that this is also instinctively known but this is a good point to start talking about your cards and not only does each card of the deck of destiny have a power an innate power each card also has an epitome an epitome is an additional benefit related directly to the harrow court And simply bringing the card into this realm will activate its epitome. It's going to be a little bit talk heavy, but I think it's a really good point now to show you what these cards can really do. Sound good? Yes, sounds good to me. So let's talk about the Paladin. Jason, if you want to scroll down... Yep. to the paladin and just read out this card's epitome a knighthood of paladins clad in shining armor manifests in the harrow court in addition to providing additional defense to the demiplane the paladins can teach the pcs the formulas for sturdy shields holy weapon runes and axiomatic weapon runes <laughs> what? exactly and you look behind you and you see to the south of the room no <laughs> This no knighthood way. of paladins clad in shining armor manifest, <gasps> and you hear their stomping boots and their beating shields as they exit through the south and begin their rounds of protecting Harrow Heart. Oh my god. I can't stop smiling right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. Gentlemen, I do believe we just acquired an army. Hoorah! (laughs) Let us go to Malachi. What's he kind of doing at the moment? Well, I was going to say that he was like flicking from the brass dwarf to the vision. He had a little inkling that his cards had something to do with this. Malachi, as you're flicking between the two cards, the brass dwarf begins resonating within your hands. Would you like to read the epitome of the brass dwarf? (laughs) <laughs> this is cool. A clockwork dwarf made of brass manifests in one of Harrowheart's workshops. The brass dwarf's presence and assistance increases the item bonus granted to crafting checks in the workshop to plus two. The brass dwarf has no name, but gracefully accepts anything that I will offer them. <laughs> the brass dwarf knows the formulas for all armor potency runes resilient potency runes energy resistant runes and fortification runes they can teach these formulas to the pcs wow and within you you now realize that harrow heart all of you realize this is not just this chamber harrow heart is made up of several different wings there is the grand hall but there is also bedrooms One for each of you. There are dining halls. Sprawling rooms capable of hosting galas to intimate nooks for single dining, depending on your current tastes. Whatever you desire will appear here. 
there are training rooms where you can retrain feats, retrain abilities, and there are workshops where you can craft or indeed use the brass dwarf to make your crafting easier. All of this oh is available to you. It's a base of operations. It's very much your new base of operations. Another base. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Malachi, also in your possession, of course, is the vision card. And the vision's epitome is Harrow Hart's workshops become enhanced. Any character may now use a workshop in Harrow Hart to attempt to borrow a spell, identify alchemy, identify magic, or learn a spell. If you do so, you apply the workshop's bonus to your skill check. The amount of work that the writers have must have put into this is insane. Don't, because there's 54 of these fuckers. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron would like to pull out the carnival. Good one to go to for you, Aaron. So the carnival, like a couple of the cards that we're now going to talk about, these ones are slightly different. So I'll let you read the epitome of the carnival. So the carnival, when you epitomise the carnival, assign it to a point of interest in the Harrow Court's farmland area. This marks the location of a colourful, vibrant and slightly off-putting fairground where festivals and celebrations are in constant swing. The simulacra who inhabit this carnival never leave and tend to subtly draw appearances and themes from potential foes the PC may face in their future. Once per week, a character can spend eight hours at the fairground simply observing its participants. Those who do can attempt a DC 28 perception check. Um, and then there are different results. There are different results. Depending on what happens with that. Ultimately, it can give you some knowledge about an upcoming NPC or an encounter that you are going to come in contact with. And if you succeed or critically succeed at that check, you are going to gain advanced knowledge about that encounter as though you had successfully recalled knowledge on it. Wow. But there are penalties if you fail as well. That is just so cool. You just go to like a, a magically created carnival. Yeah. You walk around it for a day. That's, oh God, it's so cool. Uh, okay, can I pull out my main card as well, the Empty Throne? You can indeed. You want to go ahead and read the epitome of the Empty Throne? Yes, so when you epitomize the Empty Throne, assign it to a point of interest in the Harrow Court's lake area. This marks the location of a small, rocky island atop which sits a mysterious empty throne. A character who travels to this island can perform a ritual of sacrifice before the empty throne in hopes of earning good fortune. To do so, the PC must offer valuables upon the throne that are worth 100 gold pieces times the character's level. Spend one hour meditating before the throne on the nature of loss, and then attempt a DC 30 diplomacy check. Regardless of the check's result, the offering vanishes forever, and that PC cannot attempt a new offering until they gain an experience level and are no longer affected by their current offering. So again, much like the carnival, you could spend time and money meditating at the empty throne... And in effect, you are buying a hero point. That's ultimately <laughs> what you're doing. If you critically succeed on that check, once during the next month, you can re-roll a failed or critically failed saving throw. This is a fortune effect. Oh my god. <laughs> cool, right? Yeah, this is ridiculous. So cool. Wilhelm. Wilhelm, this whole time, has just been standing like 20 feet off to the side and mostly keeping an eye on the others and then looking around still a bit suspicious but but but, but he knows there's nothing wrong here but he's, he's just still kind of looking around and um with the others all pulling out their cards and being amazed somehow he's slowly walked over to them over the past minute or so and has now pulled out his rabbit prints 
Wilhelm, you pull out the rabbit prints. You also feel the card vibrate and surge with energy as it is brought out into the Harrow Court. Would you like to read your epitome of the rabbit prints? When you epitomize the rabbit prince, assign it to a point of interest within the Harrow Court's forest area. This indicates a section of woodland where the simulacra of the Harrow Court have reported sightings of an anthropomorphic rabbit. (laughs) (laughs) A PC can travel to this location and attempt to spot the elusive rabbit prince by spending eight hours stealthily scouting the woods and attempting a DC-30 stealth check, after which no one may search for the rabbit prince again for one week. And I will tell you, if you crit succeed, the rabbit prince will gift you a plus two striking weapon of your choice, if you can find him. (laughs) A game of hide and seek. Let's go. I believe that's all six cards. Yes, sir. There is a lot to download there. But in, in summary, each card not only has its innate ability, its bonuses or de- attempts to reroll saves, it has this epitome which directly influences the Harrow Court. What do you do? Sorry, Craig, can I just qu- qualify a few things? So these gates sure. here that everyone has seen, Malachi hasn't been up to. Uh, by gates, effect. do you mean the portals on the north the wall? portals, yeah, yeah. Yep. So these sections of the Harrow the harrow court and we're in the harrow heart or are these ju- we would not know that um uh, well what i can tell you it's a good question chris so lupin you looked through and you saw this um forested area and the hammer suit above the portal not only you all now stood actually on the map for the listeners they've now each of the heroes is stood in front of one of these portals i can actually probably i'm going to take a screenshot here so each of the heroes has stood 10 feet away from one of the gates and you can all peer through and we can discuss that in a second if you want. But you also instinctively know when you stand in front of each of these portals that each will lead you to the vicinity of another card from the deck of destiny and you Oof. each know the name of said card that the portal will lead to. In front of the hammers is Lupin. Beyond the portal is the big sky. Beyond the keys with Wilhelm is the juggler. Beyond the shield is the trumpet where Malachi stands. And beyond the books is the snake bite card. (laughs) If you were to walk up to the next two, one would be the silent hag followed by the theater. And you all instinctively know that within those portals lies this card. Uh, how, how, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> it's so much information. It's, yep. uh, yeah, it's all really cool, though. This is, yeah, really cool. So I think with all of this, I, I think Lupin will seen obviously heard the the paladins that manifested when he first epitomized his his card and i think he's he will have seen them march out to the south so, um he sort of turns to the others and sort of in a, in a low voice says um I, i'm going to uh going to go and satiate my my curiosity here I, i'm going to take a look outside uh, there's no requirement to join me but you are to do so should you wish but, uh, he sort of hurries towards the south of the room. Aaron turns and runs after him and says, Mr. Malice, you have to understand, we're, we're in this together now. I'm coming with you. Yes, As the two you. of them leave, Wilhelm shouts after them, Lupin! Yes? Don't you dare let anything happen to that boy. As you wish. So Lupin and Aaron begin making their way out of the Grand Chamber, or certainly towards the south, where... The main doors are one is intact, but one is not. Wilhelm, are you staying by the portals for now? Wilhelm would probably, uh, but we can get to that in a minute if you want. But he would okay. probably um, just check around the inside and then check out some some hallways. Malachi, Malachi will stick with uh, 
Wilhelm for the time being. Lupin and Aaron, you reach the southern side of this chamber and the great doors that lead outside. You step out of those doors. Do you want another map? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we've not had enough excitement this episode. <laughs> <laughs> You step outside and you are outside this large castle. Can you all see this map? I have. I, was, I can. It's I was Qatar. Wondering if I was, losing, I was, yeah, just, I was wondering if I was losing my mind. I've been playing quite a bit of Civ, right? <laughs> Civ lately. <laughs> I've yeah. seen this in cardboard form numerous times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Welcome to Hexploration. Ooh. So you can see here, right in the center of the map, this is Harrow Heart. And I've made a little group token for you all. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's very cool excellent news <laughs> that was Love much that. better excitement than episode one so i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> you step out into the grounds of this castle and you find yourselves looking out you're on a low hill the views are quite impressive you see that these paladin guards that had appeared are now stationed all around. So just for our listeners, our players are now seeing the map of the Harrow Court. You see right in the middle is the Harrow Heart Castle. Around it is the farmland of villages, swamps, deserts, lakes, forests, mountains. And each hex is 12 miles across. That's a That's fucking big Massive. Carnival. Big place. Yeah, the castle's not 12 miles. <laughs> <laughs> not a 12-mile castle. <laughs> Within each of those zones, you can choose to assign certain ones to these epitomies that you have found. So, for example, the carnival has to be assigned to a point of interest in the Harrow Court's farmland area. So d does it matter where we choose to place them? I believe it is just for your own kind of building your world yeah yeah i think um they are marked so we'll play it by the book so you can choose this hex this hex this hex for the listeners that's the three um kind of bordering where they are in the middle of the map so i think kazeron and lupin have have come out of the cathedral to the south so the hex immediately to the south of them he like holds the carnival card out towards the farmland and as you do this aaron you see within that hex, suddenly much brighter lights appear. Maybe a ferris wheel, maybe a tower of doom. And you see that you have manifested the carnival in the southern hex. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in the castle. Meanwhile. <laughs> Malachi and Wilhelm, you were stood by the portals you saw lupin and aaron leave i'm gonna say that you said well you said you were exploring the castle a bit yeah so you take one of the side doors out of that main room and as i said you find these different wings these different locations you find the bedrooms you find the dining halls the trading rooms the workshops and as you enter the workshop you hear the clinking of iron as you step in the brass dwarf is stood there uh, hello. Welcome. May I help you, sire? I assume you have just got here? I have always been here. Of course you have. Um, w what is your name? I I'm Wilhelm. My name. Yes, and, th and this is Malachi. My name is Groldo. Doesn't it say on the card? Yeah, he's fucking he lying. Have, he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't ex <laughs> explicitly <laughs> says he doesn't have a name. Just, yeah. a, just doesn't want to miss <laughs> <Malachi naming him. laughs> My name is Groldo. I aim to please. I defy my creator's parameters. <laughs> I will name myself. <laughs> Fuck you, Ron Lundin. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Do you require crafting assistance? Um, M Malachi. Yeah? That thing on you that I believe you called it a key tar? 
That's right. <laughs> Does it require any sort of runes? Well, yeah, I think it could do with a bit of buffing, really. It does a bit of damage, but I do think I could have a bit more from it. Where's the brass dwarf when you need him? Is he just there? He's, I he's am here. sitting right here with us. He just talked to us. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I, Groldo. You called him Groldo? I, no. He named himself. Mr. Dwarf. <laughs> M- Mr. Dwarf. Where's Groldo? <laughs> <laughs> Where's Groldo? There's the episode title. Where's Groldo? <laughs> Where's Groldo? <laughs> Ladies prefer Groldo. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, I can name you, but I, I quite like Groldo. We'll we'll run with it. How can come you, uh, you get to name him? <laughs> it's my card. Do you wish to rename me? No, Groldo's fine. Could you uh, sort me out with a bit more, a uh, bit more damage on my battle keytar? Perhaps we can save crafting for off air. <laughs> Absolutely, I will. Uh, I'll go and have a look through my book and see what I can find. May I say, sires, you both look wounded. You both look tired. May I suggest finding your quarters and resting? I do think that's quite a good idea, Medakai. I don't know about you, but it's, it has been a few years since I since I've had my my own room. Would would you want to check out our bedrooms with me? <laughs> well, I think that's an offer I can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> so you return back to the bed chambers, and Wilhelm, I'm going to say you step into this fairly small room. It looks quite sparse. But as you step in, you realize that if you were to spend a few seconds visualizing and meditating, the room would be perfectly equipped for your own personal needs. I never want to see inside Malachi's room. (laughs) No. (laughs) How come I can clearly hear that there's a swing in in, in Malachi's room, but I don't have one? (laughs) <laughs> Malachi's just, already on on the IKEA website. Um. Just, just everything is Scotch guarded. Just everything. <laughs> Scotch <laughs> mist. What a punchline. Okay. Um, and Wilhelm standing there and, and realizing this s- sort of closes his eyes for a few seconds and and not really sure what he's supposed to do, just focuses on the room in front of him and as you focus the room shifts and melds to what your vision desired what do we see in Wilhelm's bedroom it is not the biggest it is not the the most um, extravagant it is a simple bed and a, a, a chest in the front of it a s- small closet and basically it's just what he imagined is his his room back home and um th- there's a small stand in front of the door where there's a few sparring weapons which have dull blades and um there's some especially compared to the one he's wearing <laughs> um very fresh and new looking garbs which look identical to his one and um there's even a small stack of, of uh, papers on his little desk that stood in the corner with a, a feather and ink on the edge of the table. And th- th- those appear to be letters of some, of some sort which are written in a language that Malachi can't read. Very nice description, Wilhelm. As you look around you, feel a sense of inner peace come over you. Probably the most peaceful you might have felt in some time. You're fairly sure that if you were to spend the night here, you would feel fully rested. M- Malachi realizes that Wilhelm is kind of stunned by this and, and sort of takes a small step back as he just tries to get a grasp on where he's standing right now. And as if he's being pulled out of a sort of trance, he shakes his head a bit and, and looks over to Malachi and goes, um, 
R- right, let's let's check out your room and and leaves hurriedly. So Malachi, you see this transformation take place. It happens instantly for you. Further up the corridor within this castle, these stone walls, the dust and cobwebs still very much present. You see a room that is clearly meant for you. And as we reach the threshold of the room and he turns in, you see posters adorning (laughs) the black walls of various artists that Malachi followed or idolised. There's a massive one of Rufus Nimblethwick over your yes. head. Yeah, there's I definitely thought, one of Rufus Nimblethwick. Yeah. I thought I thought you were uh, going to say they were all of Malachi. <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple of Malachi as well from from his playing days. Yes, or oh, continues playing days. It's just his mom's basement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is a rotating bed in the middle. Um, right, with a mirror <laughs> on the top, <laughs> on the ceiling. Yeah, on the ceiling, clad in leopard skin, leopard print, and all of the instruments that you, you could ever want to uh, ever want to play. And it's just matte black with the uh, little lights that move around, magical lights. You went for the dancing lights package. Yeah. <laughs> and there's loads, there's a desk there as well with lots of parchment on it, lots of songs that haven't quite made it to light yet. You also feel, Malachi, this sense of peace. As you're doing this, and as Lupin and Aaron are stood outside, you hear a large bell ring. Ding! You instinctively know that dinner has been served in the Great Hall. As you head back there, you see that Milton has prepared a table. It is set with fine silver. There are drinks and food. You then see more people, two or three servants coming in and placing food on the table, filling your drinks, bowing to you as they pull out the chairs for you to sit in, place napkins, silk napkins upon your laps. Milton looks to you and says, Sires, would you like to make a toast? Uh, yes. To the Harrowheart and to new companions and Lupin casts a glance back to the main hallway in the portals and the future adventure and raises a glass. Well said, sir. Well said. And the two or three servants that are around as well ting their glasses, give a polite round of applause. Uh, what is the food? It's a whole mixture. <laughs> There's fresh game, roasted vegetables, honeydew melon, a real smorgasbord, a charcuterie. <laughs> There's meze, <laughs> <laughs> tapas. So Aaron will start eating. And we'll say to Milton, uh, Milton, just how big is the Harrow Court? We looked beyond the Harrow Heart and it just seems to stretch on endlessly. It's enormous. Sire, I am but a humble butler. I serve here. For many miles the Harrow Court reaches. How far it goes, that would be beyond the mountains. The, the portals to the north... Do they lead elsewhere in the Harrow Court, or do they take us somewhere else? No, sire. The portals lead you out of the Harrow Court and back into Galarian. Of course, if you wish to return, you have found your way here once. I am sure you could do so again. Actual Galarian? Is there more than one, sire? (laughs) Well, before today, I would have said no, but uh, there has been a learning experience on quite a number of fronts quite. You do seem out of sorts. Yes, that's uh, certainly one way of putting it. Um, after a sort of slightly lengthy pause, it's uh, Lupin. Well, uh, yes, uh, dinner looks fine. Yes, sire. Prepared by the finest cooks of the Harrow Court. Enjoy. You notice he's not eating. Please, uh, be- please don't, don't wait on our part. Sire, as you know, I am unable to eat. We are here to serve you, as all of the residents of the Harrow Court are. I appreciate your offer to dine, but I am unable to consume. Do we just lock him in the fridge then? Be done with it. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That's good. The noise that Butler used to make used to terrify me. (laughs) 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 
I think Aaron Aaron has probably not had a meal this large and this uh, is it like decadent? Would you say it's good? Yeah, it's yeah, good food, like luxurious. Um, and does he and you, feel it, full as he's yes, eating it? Very much so. Yeah. As they're eating, I, I think Lupin will will sort of make sort of slightly probing small talk, sort of just trying to not not being excessively obvious or, or intrusive with it, but is sort of subtly trying to, to just sort of prod and, and get a better understanding of, of just the broad... He's not maybe really going for anything specific, just that general understanding of, of the way the Harrow Court works, because obviously none of us... the These people seem to have, or certainly the one we've met, seems to have an understanding that we've always been here and that we should know all of this, but you know, obviously our experience is different. The questions you ask, he answers honestly but there is an air an overriding air that you can kind of infer that these people although they seem real are maybe not real they're they're kind of like the unseen servants aren't they of i I can't remember the spell but like you know the one where you can create like a mansion and there are servants there to attend you and they're kind of real but not real and are we talking similar to like a replicant in blade runner I've not watched Blade Runner for a few years, but okay. it's, uh, it's yeah. So is is they are uh, that they're, they're like you say not aware that they are not human, essentially. Yeah, it depends kind of how probing you go with them. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd go that hard. The general impression you get from them is that they've always been here. They are here. Their very existence is here. If you ask a question, well, say, well, how do you feel about? coming into existence it's not something they can comprehend or answer you to them they have always been here this has always been here life has always been this and you have always been part of that life this might be a good point to mention that as you realize this and as you as as he explains that he is unable to eat you notice that Wilhelm has not eaten anything <laughs> luckily Eric Anesh is not here to make you <laughs> <laughs> Wilhelm, won't you have anything to eat? I'm not hungry, thank you. Roll deception check. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to... Uh, Malachi, I assume you're eating. Oh yes, all of the food. So Milton sits there answering your questions. Sires, the hour draws late. I shall be retiring for the night. Is there anything else you require of me? No, you've been very gracious. Uh, I don't think there's anything. Is there anything, guys? No, no, thank you, Milton. Uh, your assistance is appreciated, uh, as all, always. Yes, sire. Breakfast will be served at seven. I will have Mabel prepare your favourites. Bags of hair for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> He's been dying to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Malachi notices nothing and is still head head first into the food. And you eat and you feel replete. I am I think I'm ready for rest now. Yes. Sort of looping looks at everyone still being sort of slightly patched up as a Yes, another a trying day. And we, we seem to be somewhat of a streak of those at the moment. So yes, I'm certainly ready for good night's rest. Thank you all for stepping through with me. I'm glad that you're here. It has been educational. And uh, Aaron is going to wander the hall and find the door that leads to his room. Aaron, you again see a plain, unadorned room. And he opens the door to this room. And inside he sees four walls of polished obsidian stone, black and oily, and he almost struggles to catch his breath because it's a room that he has seen many, many times before. And it's very plainly decorated with just books lining the floor and a bedroll. And then there's a basin with a series of bandages and poultices and things for him to treat his burns as he sleeps. And he steps in and he has tears in his eyes stepping back into this room that he's not seen for years. And he closes the door. Everyone closes the door, prepares himself for sleep, 
washes his hands, performs his nightly rituals, lays his head down on the pillow and falls into sleep. The scene changes. We see endless snow amidst jutting pillars of earth that pierce the low-hanging clouds that are settled around the mountain tops. The desolate heights of the Stormspear Mountains are almost otherworldly and empty, save for a single figure who stands alone atop a cliff edge that faces out towards the horizon. The view from here seems to drink in the entirety of Galarian below. Garbed in thick hides to shelter against the bitter cold, he holds an instrument out at arm's length, obscuring the sun from his vision and begins fastidiously recording distances and trajectories. His calculations complete, he checks a pocket watch. He is waiting. What little we see of his face protruding from his hood and shawls is wizened by middle age. His expression flickers with nervousness and his focused gaze remains unbroken on the distant landscapes below. A tone in the air changes almost imperceptibly. But it is a sound he knows all too well at this point. Whoosh, whoosh. The distant ripples of air beaten by enormous leathery wings and a huge scaly hide. And the curtain comes down. You've been listening to Describe Your Kill, The Death of Destiny. Find out more at describeyourkill.com. Thank you to Paizo, Michael Gelfi, Creator Cord, Sirenscape, Kevin McLeod, Foundry, and Sigil Services. Get all the links on our website. This podcast uses trademarks and or copyrights owned by Paizo Inc. Used under Paizo's community use policy. We are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. This podcast is not published, endorsed, or specifically approved by Paizo. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. 